can I offer you sincere congratulations on this film, which is a lowbrow comedy movie. But as I've long said, there's no problem with being a lowbrow film as long as you hit what you aim for. Is that a fair comment? <laughs> That's absolutely, yes. We aimed for the knees and I think we hit them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, uh, now, Mark, um, I guess a subtitle to this interview could be how to build a lowbrow comedy. Because I would like to sort of get into some of the detail, maybe deconstruct how a coarse lowbrow comedy works. And yeah. I'm just wondering, did you have, going into this, given that it was a sequel to a very grossed out comedy film, which we can mention in detail in a few minutes, what was your, I guess, your guiding principle making A Few Less Men? Well, I guess it was because um, the reason that the sequel came about was that the first movie proved, in fact, so popular, not so much in Australia, but sort of internationally. And so that was kind of the impetus was. Um, and the thing that the producers and Dean Cray gleaned from the first movie, the thing that sort of was the strongest was that friendship group, those three boys, behave, or those four boys originally, of course, behaving badly. We kill one of them off, so there's only three of them. But it was that kind of notion of the boys behaving badly that they decided to carry on into kind of the second movie. So I didn't really have a lot to do with that early development of it. I was, I was, pretty, I was presented a script which was pretty much a finished kind of product. I certainly did another pass. I went to Los Angeles, Dean and I did another pass at it. But kind of the idea came from, I guess, honouring, in a sense, the idea of the first movie, being true to that, but trying to think of something different for it. So the first movie was about those blokes all being in one place behaving badly. And so... The idea was to try and keep that kind of exploring that friendship, but this time to put them on the road. So it became sort of a road movie, if you like. Okay, so just to be clear here, in terms of straight out screenwriting and filmmaking principles, as a director, as coarse and as cheap and as broad as the comedy can get, you're saying that you still need a core value from which to bounce everything off. And without that, the film won't work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think there's got to be a strong... For me, it's sort of the first thing I look for in any screenplay, whether it's this kind of very broad comedy or a more sophisticated comedy or a romance or whatever it is. That there's got to be kind of some sort of diamond idea at the heart of it. And, and no matter how, as you say, kind of coarse and wacky and how many penis and fart jokes there are, there's got to be the idea that you're honouring kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Now, just to get on to the nature of the humour, you just mentioned penis and fart jokes. I have to ask you, in all semi-seriousness, the appeal, the enduring appeal of the fart joke. And just to background this, we've had Dave Allen speak of his eternal love of the fart joke. We've had John Cleese deriding the fart joke and in the Louis C.K. series Louis he actually has an argument with a fellow comedian who is defending his lowbrow humour Louis C.K. breaks down saying that he too against all his high-minded concepts of comedy also loves fart jokes Mark Lamprell yeah. what accounts for the enduring appeal of the fart joke you know what? I think, Jim, it's because inside each and every one of us, there is a very naughty 15-year-old. And I think the enduring appeal of the fart joke is that is that simply that silly, no, it's silly and naughty. And, and to me, that sort of that's that's the appeal of humour. It's it's the place where where all things are possible, really. It's, it's, when you're being funny, you really throwing all the cards up in the air and you're just sort of seeing them where they land. And when they land on a fart, it's just, it's funny. And I think it's because it taps into something very simple and joyous and unavoidable about, about 
about our shared humanity. You know, we all fight. Does it also speak to the fact that there is only one place in the world where a fart is appropriate and that in every other context it's always inappropriate and that that speaks to the nature of comedy, inappropriateness? Absolutely. I think you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there. It's sort of, it's, it's doing what's not right, really, is what comedy is. It's the shock kind of thing, that, that little shock element. And the wonderful thing about farts is they're just not that offensive. I mean, they're supposedly terrible public mistakes and you're not supposed to do them, you know, in front of your family and friends. But occasionally when they pop out, um, uh, you know, it's embarrassing, but it's not terrible. So I think there's, there's kind of an acceptability to it, you know. Um, but of course, by virtue of the fact that we all fart and, and this happens to us all, there's sort of a, a kind of a, an unoriginality to it as well. You know, and I think that's what people rail against, really, you know. Now, can I just ask you, in parentheses, have you ever had a question regarding fart humour that has had as much backgrounding and as much research put into it as the ones that I've just asked you? No, Jim, I think you absolutely take the prize in, uh, in fart joke research and uh, detail. Congratulations to you. I... <laughs> I thank you very much, and I will include that in the finished interview. <laughs> now, mate, given the uh, excesses to which the previous film went in terms of its visual humour, your film does not go that far. I'm keen to know the, the lines that you decided not to cross, how you defined the boundaries of the comedy in this film. Yeah, I, look, I, it's, it's not that I wouldn't have gone that far. You know, I certainly would have had the boys putting their arms up a sheep's bottom if, if they hadn't done it the first movie. Um, so it's interesting that I bet the, the physical comedy doesn't go quite as far in, the, in, this, in this second movie. Um, and it, that's more just a happenstance of how the script was written, really. Uh, we didn't pull back moments. I, there, were, there were things that I was restrained about, like when one of the lads um, has sex with a, a much older lady um, uh, uh, for various reasons. Um, you know, like, I, I didn't sort of completely go there with the coverage on that, although you do see kind of a bit of, you know, action. Um, but, uh, it, you know, like, I, I suppose I, I wanted it to be um, shocking and surprising, but not, not to the extent where people would pull out of the experience. Um, and go, oh, no, I don't want to see that, or, or be turned off by it. I think one of the big things for me in a movie like this is keeping an audience engaged. Like, you're, you're, you're asking them to suspend disbelief for a very long time. A lot of very silly things happen in this movie. And so I guess I wanted to... I didn't, I didn't want to get to that point where the audience pop out of the story so much, whether they find it so either offensive or unbelievable that they pop out of the disbelief and they just stay there. You know what I mean? I wanted them to sort of stay on that journey. So I guess that kind of is my explanation for the more restrained nature of the humour. Is there a degree of liberation for a director when you kind of know and your cast know from the outset that this is a film unlikely to you know, win prestigious awards when everyone's on the same page and you know you're not going for Oscar bait. Is yeah, there a freedom that liberating. comes with that? It's, it's so liberating, I can't tell you. Yeah. It's oh, wonderful. please tell me, though. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, um, it's, it's, what is liberating is that you, you just know you're making a fun film. You're here to have fun. You're here to make people laugh, to lose themselves for an hour and a half in the cinema. You're not here to raise them up, to make them wiser, richer, whatever. Uh, you're just here for the fun of it. And, and so it is incredibly liberating to be in a room with actors and to be in a room with filmmakers to go, let's just make this the most fun we can make it. We don't have to kind of... We don't have a kind of an ethical obligation to educate or transform. Our job here is, is simply to, to entertain. And because this film is a sequel because the original film made so much money overseas, can I ask you, Mark, 
does this film come pre-packaged with a distribution deal? Uh, it does in a lot of territories. So, for example, in fact, I, I don't think it had such a distribution deal in South America, but right now it's opening across South America in Spanish. So I've just been doing press all morning with Peru and Ecuador and places like that. So, uh, yes, it has sold to a lot of territories. It's sold across Africa. It's sold in uh, Russia and in in sort of former Soviet Europe. It's sold in the oddest places, really, and also then the more the more ones you'd expect, like Italy and and that kind of stuff as well. So it's also got a broad release, yeah.